but obviously I'm from Lunda Construction and my role with the company is I do DBE, which is Disadvantaged Businesses, EEO, STEM and Outreach. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about all of the stuff that goes into building a bridge other than the bridge building. And then I'm going to turn it over to Mike and he's going to show you some construction stuff that you maybe wouldn't see. So there's my agenda. Um, like I said, I'm just going to tell you some stuff that you probably didn't know about the things that the contractors do. So Lunda Construction, um, we are headquartered in Black River Falls, Wisconsin, and we were really excited to be able to be a part of this project. Um, we also have an office in Milwaukee and in Coates, Minnesota, and Hilbert. And we would like to create a bigger presence in Missouri. Like we don't want to just do this bridge and leave. So we're about making connections with people and making a difference in the community. This is just a montage of some of the other major river crossings that we've done and bridges. The one that's close to my heart is the one way over there in the corner. That's the I-74 bridge. It's over the Mississippi River. There's some more photos in here of that. So these are some major projects that Lund has been involved with. Um, if you had a a person that had been with Lunda for 300 years, they'd tell you all about each and every one of them. I really only care about a couple of them, this one being it. I also, I have to throw in there that we are a Tudor Perini company. So Lunda Construction is owned by Tudor, Tudor Perini, and these are all of the construction companies that are in our family. So this is our project that we're working on right now. You guys are very familiar with it. That's what it used to look like before we came. And it's the I-70 Rocheport Bridge. It's our first project in Missouri. And um, I'll let Mike talk about the scope when we get a little further along. We also have a current project that's the Southwest Light Rail. Um, <clears throat> that one is in Minneapolis and it's a, a rail project. It's been going on for about six years. We still have a few more years left with it. It's like our other super projects. So we have a lot of little projects, Southwest Light Rail and this project right now. This is the project that I just left. It's the I-74 bridge over the Mississippi. It's in Rock Island and Moline and Davenport and Bettendorf. Mike was with me on this project. It's been an award-winning winning bridge. Um, we just completed it right before we came here and it's a double basket handle bridge, as you can see. And it's actually really beautiful. And we had a ton of complications getting it completed. Um, so we were really prepared to come down here and fight the Missouri river and your river's actually been pretty kind to us, a little kinder than the Mississippi was. <laughs> so we've, uh, if you're driving through the country, you can see some of the other bridges we did. This is the Hastings river bridge. There's St. Croix, the Lafayette bridge, um, we also do a lot of overpasses and light rail projects, Lowry Avenue Bridge, 6th Street Viaduct, Maryland Avenue Bridge, Crosstown Commons, Marquette Interchange, the Zoo Interchange. I My project manager for my 74 came off of this project, so I heard about this one all the time. Wakota Bridge. And I love this slide because there's quite a few from I-74, like that one's on I-74. And uh, I wanted to say that a lot of the team from the I-74 bridge that had all of that experience crossing the Mississippi River has come down here with us to work on this bridge. So Lunda Construction is about connecting people, like building connections with bridges. And our goal is, yes, to have a safe workplace, but also to leave a lasting memory with the places that we leave. Like, we don't want to just leave you with a beautiful bridge. We're going to do that. But we also want to leave an impact on the community. Um, so some of the things that we do is, is building futures. One of the ways that Lunda tries to um, leave a lasting impression when they leave is taking advantage of the disadvantaged business um, program. Does anybody know what a DBE is? So a disadvantaged business is kind of like EEO, but only for small businesses. So it's a federally mandated um, by the Department of Transportation. Every um, project that is funded by either MoDOT or the DOT 
um, has a certain percentage of the work that has to be done by DBEs, disadvantaged businesses. Um, for this particular project, the I-70 Rocheport project, we had a 15% goal that had to be met during design and a 10% goal that had to be met during construction. And we've already met both of those goals. So if you want to know more about DBE, you can always check out MoDOT's website. So on MoDOT's website, it'll tell you how to become a DBE. Or if you're familiar with any small businesses that are minority owned or disadvantaged in some ways, it is very beneficial for them to register with the Missouri Department of Transportation because it's kind of a free advertising for them. So how would you find a disadvantaged business to know that you could hire them to work on your project and you could help them maybe not be a small business anymore? MoDOT has on their website, the MRCC. And the MRCC is a listing of all of the disadvantaged businesses that are registered with the state and can be you know, hired to work on projects. And they, you can search them by their name. You can search them by what they do um, and you can search them by company size. So <clears throat> these are the objectives of the DBE program and what it was entitled to do. And again, it's to ensure non-discrimination. It helps small businesses get a foothold. It also lets them um, be mentored by a, a larger contractor so they can kind of learn the ropes or, or maybe have access to equipment that they wouldn't have otherwise. Um, it also ensures that people don't take advantage of the program. So they have to be qualified as a DBE. Um, Again, all of that information is on MoDOT's website. Um, if you're interested in becoming a DBE or if you know someone who would be helped by this program, you can either contact myself or you can go to MoDOT and I can, and I can also hook you up to the right people that would make that possible. These are the criteria of becoming a disadvantaged business. So again, like I said, it's like EEO. So the company has to be either at least 51% owned by a minority or a female. Um, they have to be under a certain income. Um, and then MoDOT partners them with a subcontractor that can, can help them grow their business and, and give them some of that federal work. Another goal that Lunda has is leaving a lasting legacy, and that's to make sure that we can grow our workforce. So another way that you can grow your workforce is with on-the-job training. Um, again, it's a federally mandated program and we take it really serious. It is a way for disadvantaged people to get involved in the trades and be either become a journeyman or discover what their career is gonna look like. Um, MoDOT requires a certain amount of people on every job to be an OJT candidate. Um, it encourages young people to get involved. Um, oh, here we are. So on this Ro Rocheport project, we have had seven participants in the OJT. And I'm actually really excited to say that I still have two of them and both of my OJT candidates on this project are both female. So we've worked really hard to, to keep those female numbers up because females in construction are, are kind of rare and have two of them be apprentices and just learning about it and be female is kind of a, a big accomplishment. So this slide is, it just says STEM stories. I was going to share with us a couple, with you a couple of our STEM stories and what they are is we have done interviews with people who work on our job site um, that have grown up in the trades and and how they've been successful and what they've done and the training that they've had and, and kind of what their journey is in an attempt to encourage young people to get involved with the trades, but they're not ready for publication yet. So I'm going to encourage you to keep watching for those. They will show up either on Lunda's LinkedIn page, on MoDOT's Facebook page, or um, on the MoDOT website for the project. Like I already have eight of them ready for publication, but they're not quite polished up enough for me to share with you today. But if you're watching for them, you will see them. And they are true life stories of people that are working on the job right now. Um, that was my filler page. 
I don't know if anybody recognizes anyone from the team there, but those are two MoDOT um, employees and two of our interns that, that were on this project. We've been really serious about outreach and we wanted to make sure that all of the public was really informed of what's going on with the project. So kind of like you guys have the Muddy River series, we have Superintendent Saturdays. It's usually, I believe, the third Saturday, the third Saturday of the month, weather permitting. So we probably won't have another one till maybe April. Um, this is what the advertisements for those look like. They last about an hour. They're usually somewhere close to the site. And our superintendent or one of our project managers, Mike has done it before, or a representative of MoDOT just gives you an update on, on the project. Um, so watch MoDOT's Facebook page or Lunda's LinkedIn page or the project website on MoDOT and you can discover when the next one of them is. I encourage you guys to attend. They're very relaxed, very conversational, but you kind of know what's going on with the next part of the project. I know you've been to a couple of them. <laughs> this was just um, an example of what the advertisement looks like. So I don't know if you guys spend a lot of time looking at the um, MoDOT website. It gets kind of convoluted because you have to get all the way to the project. But we, every month, Lunda and MoDOT partner to do Road to Rocheport. You're going to come save me. Um, so this is the most current Road to Rocheport video. And it, again, gives an update on, on the project. It shows you what's going on. Um, it usually tells us when your next superintendent Saturday is, and there's usually some pretty good interviews and video in there. And I wanted to share one with you so that you could see the amazing work that they're doing. Oh, oh yeah. It's the actual computer shadow, isn't it? It has, I actually knew it was there, but I thought it was me. Yep, go for it. Welcome to the November update on the Lance Corporal Leon D. Rapp's Interstate 70 Missouri River Bridge near Rocheport. This month's project highlights include the reopening of the Route BB interchange, the removal of the old piers, and the continuation of the drill trap work. This project features state of the art engineering and construction techniques, guaranteeing a bridge that not only meets, but exceeds safety standards. Let's hear from Project Director Mike Shoup for this month's update. Hello, my name is Mike Shoup. I'm the Project Director for the Rocheport River Bridge Replacement. Uh, we're moving into mid-November. We're continuing to work on the uh, replacement of the second bridge, the eastbound bridge over the river. Uh, last week, we actually opened up the Route BB interchange uh, for traffic. That bridge has been closed since mid-June, uh, so the town of Rocheport is happy to see that bridge open. Uh, we striped that yesterday. Everything looks really good there. As far as the river bridge itself, uh, we're continuing to demo the footings that exist out in the river. We have one more blast schedule for that, which should take place later this afternoon. Uh, we'll, we will demo those two footings and then remove them from the river. When we started this bridge, we had four drilled shafts to do. We poured the second drilled shaft yesterday, so we have two shafts yet to do in the river. So we'll do those two shafts, and we'll continue to work on uh, driving the shell piling, which is on land and over the scour hole. We have several of those vents already completed. We poured a vent cap yesterday, and about every two days, we will leapfrog from one bench to the next, pour another cap. And we'll continue this work all the way through the winter. So we hopefully we'll have the substructure work done come spring. Once that's done, we'll start set girders and working on decking for the for the deck for the bridge. We're still on schedule to have this bridge open by the end of December of 2024. The journey towards overall project completion continues with the reopening of the Route BB interchange, which took place on November 8th. The improvements at this interchange provide smoother traffic flow and increased connectivity for the Roseport community. While Interstate 70 traffic utilizes the new westbound bridge, the eastbound bridge is taking shape right before our eyes. When completed, 
The two bridges will each host three lanes of traffic, providing a more reliable structure for years to come. Out with the old, in with the new. The removal of these old piers mark a symbolic transition towards a modernized and upgraded infrastructure. It's incredible to see how the landscape is evolving to meet the demands of the future. Beyond aesthetics, the removal process is carefully planned to minimize environmental impacts and ensure a more sustainable future for Rocheport. But our journey doesn't end here. Let's explore the fascinating world of shale piling and drilling. Shale piling and drilling are essential steps in fortifying the bridge's foundation, where precision meets power creating a stable base that can withstand the test of time. These cutting edge technologies play a crucial role in enhancing the bridge's resilience against natural elements. The combination of precise drilling and strategically placed shell piles ensures a foundation that will support motors and commerce for generations. Thank you for watching the latest Road to Roachport video segment. Remember to like, share, and subscribe to MoDOT Central Missouri District for more content on the project Shaping Central Missouri. Until next time, stay safe, buckle up, and put your phone down when on the road. So I wanted to tell you a couple things about this video. One, they are produced monthly by one of the DBEs on site. So she does a really great job getting that all put together. Um, there has been one done every month that the project's been out there. So there's a lot of information on there. I make my children watch them because I think it's important for them to know what I do every day. Um, but there's a lot of good um, interviews. Um, several of our management team has been interviewed. Most of the MoDOT team has been interviewed. Um, and there's a lot of good information on them. They can also be found on the MoDOT website for the project and they can be found on um, LinkedIn on Lunda's portion. So now we're gonna go to the STEM portion and it was kind of a new idea for, for MoDOT. They required and requested that we take care of it, um, but it, it grew into something much bigger than we ever expected. So there was always the STEM outreach portion, a part of this contract. And we were just really lucky to have the people to work with that we are working with. These are all of the people that so far have been involved with our STEM outreach program. And what a STEM outreach program is, is it's how you reach children in the grade school age, all the way through high school to encourage them to get involved either in engineering, bridge building or the trades. And it, it definitely grew into something much larger than we ever expected it to. And it's been really successful. So I was, I wanted to tell you guys about it today because I'm hoping it gets some legs. I don't want that when this bridge is completed, that all of this hard work that we've put into it just ends here. So I'm kind of hoping that you guys take it out in the world with you. I've spent a lot of times trying to get the word out. Um, but what it is, is it's a 12 lesson interactive program for children to encourage them into construction. And it, it's about not just construction, but transportation. And again, like I said, it's K through 12. I will say most of the lessons are middle school or higher just because of the, the way they work. Um, but we have a pretty broad reach on them. Um, we created lesson plans that are um, concurrent with educational standards. We even consulted with Mizzou as well as um, some high school and junior high teachers to make sure that our content was relevant and appropriate for the students that they were getting there. We want, we want them to be accessible to the public and that's been my biggest challenge so far. So um, I'll tell you how you can find them in the future. Otherwise you can contact me and I will give them to you. I want everyone to take them home and do them with their kids or your grandkids or take them to your local grade schools. Um, but it, it lets children know that there's, there's possibilities of being successful in construction in ways they never even imagined. Um, like I said, we developed it in collaboration with teachers, but also the Missouri of engineering, the Missouri, um, engineering department. Um, her name's Sarah Ortman, and she's done an amazing job developing our curriculum. 
those are the lessons that we have created so far. There's, there's 12 lessons. Um, I believe only five are published. We'll get there a little bit sooner, but th they will all be published before we complete this project. This is a quote that we, we received when we uh, took this kind of, I'm going to say took it on the road. Um, and that's a picture of us when we visited a, um, one of the schools and we've just gotten some really good feedback because in addition to having a lesson, we also have a hands-on project and a video that goes hand in hand with every lesson that we've created. So, so far, these are the schools that I have, have visited personally. So we, we, we take these, these presentations and we, we go there, we give a presentation, we do a project with the kids, we give them handouts and then they can keep their project with them. Um, and these are all of the ones that I've personally visited. Um, and it, the response has been really amazing. Um, but you don't have to be an engineer to do these, these lessons. They, they are completely canned. Everything that you need to know to, to do these lessons is, is right there in, in the curriculum. So in addition to these outreaches, we have also had Missouri Engineering. Um, one of their classes came to our job site and they did a capstone class. They had two sessions. They, they came as, as one of their senior projects and they were allowed to do a bid on the Rocheport Bridge. And then they came back and presented it to our project managers and we told them how that would be good or how it wouldn't work. Um, those are the sc schools that we've attended and what lessons we've done. Uh, we also participated in the Missouri STEM Cubs, which is a summer program. And um, I can't even tell you how many times we presented there. And we also did build my future. This is some photos from STEM Cubs. And you can see there's, um, we also included our uh, interns. So our interns were part of doing the presentations. And if you go on site and watch some of the presentations, they are actually done by the interns that were Mizzou um, students at the time, which is, I think is really exciting because it's, it's using our interns and it's reaching out and it's OJT opportunities for them also. We also attended um, Build My Future. Um, there's all kinds of Build My Future um, events throughout Missouri. We happened to go to the one in Jeff City. And when we went there, we took that, see that bridge behind me. See, because I'm cute there in the middle. Um, we took that bridge and there was like 1,500 students there. They're junior and seniors. And that bridge behind me went up and down 15 times that day. And we had we have plans for that bridge, and I I will also share those plans with you if anyone ever wants to know how to build that, all the way from a cut list to plans of how to build it. So and that one's been on the road too. It um, so that was in Missouri. We also took it to um, Minneapolis and Wisconsin. So that one's been around a little bit. And two of the gentlemen on there are off of my job site. They're they're not even they're not even in management. Um, so by the time this is completed. We will have nine STEM outreach sessions. Um, we did do the project site visit already on April 20th and not including um, Build My Future, we've visited individually with 235 students. So I hope we get the word out there that construction is like a, a really great future and a really great way to um, spend your career. Um, this is the, that is the, the capstone project. So those are the, the kiddos that were on that Mizzou project. So how can you find these lessons that we have poured our life's work into? They are located on, that is a snippet of the MoDOT website. So if you go to MoDOT website and you go to the um, central region and you go to the Rocheport project, there is a little tab that says STEM and one, two, three, four, five, five of them are on there. So if you would just click on how bridges work, there is a elementary, middle school and high school lesson. There's a video that leads the entire lesson. There's a project and there's a printout. And then there's a printout that tells you everything you need to do the project. And that's for each one of those. 
So we, I really want it to get legs. Like I really want you guys to spend Christmas building a bridge out of toothpicks and dots so that all of these kids can learn how to build bridges. Um, so before I go any further or I turn it over to Mike, do you guys have any questions about DBEs, um, about our STEM project or about outreach or superintendent Saturday or STEM stories? build something like that. Oh, uh, you mean the one that the kiddos were building? Yes. Oh, this one? Yes. So this one I have, um, I think we did a running total on it and, and it's, it's been done several times. Like we used that one. So I think we probably have about $1,200 in it because there's all those yes. PVC pipes, but again, it's one that I take somewhere and let them construct and reconstruct and we'll use it for several years. Um, as far as one at home, we have smaller versions of that with STEM, literally that bridge with strings and straws, and it looks identical to that. Um, this one, they actually even have bridge pans and PVC and everything in it. And like I said, that's why that one has traveled with us. So that would be more like one that you would want to do if you wanted to go visit a larger thing. Like I had 1500 kids put that one together and take it apart. So that one's a little bit more pricey, but the projects that are the small ones, I, you can do for like three bucks, like literally dots and straws and stuff like that. And I had somebody else have their hand up for something. Was it you? No? Anybody? Okay. I got to find the right slide and then I'm going to turn it over to Mike and he's going to tell you a little bit about the construction of our bridge and show you some stuff you might not have seen. Okay. I think it's here. Yep, it's you, Mike. Turn your mic on. Okay. I'm going to turn mine off. So I'm check, not going to Check you. one, two. Hello, darling. Nice to see you. So, everybody, put your hands together for Julie. She's been working her tail off, working really hard for the DBE, the outreach programs, and especially the STEM program. Without putting some information out there for the younger, uh, generation they're really they're kind of we're losing this in the trades i see it every day it's not uh what she's doing and what modot's doing and everybody's putting this together we've got to get the younger generation more involved we're um it, or we're going to lose it we have so much out there that needs to be done and we need somebody to build it and without any interest and people coming up and wanting to build this i mean what are we going to do it's she's working her tail off so thank you julie so uh, I kind of dug in and found some pictures. Uh, I'm going to go along and show you some stuff that you don't normally see, kind of like uh, how does this get done or how does this get done? And if anyone has any questions as we go along, just feel free to ask. Just jump out there because uh, it is what it is. But first of all, uh, this is the old bridge here, and then uh, we got – the construction here with the pipe piles. So we've got two different designs going through here. We've got the approach before you get to the water span, which is with pipe pile here, these uh, shell piles here, they're four foot in diameter. So we drive those into the ground and then we form them up. You can see the form up here and then we pour concrete and that's the pier cap. Uh, that's about 130 foot of pipe there. So from the ground down about hundred foot. So we'll, we'll, we'll uh, drive one section down. There was a video on there. It had that green thing. It was like a vibro machine. It, so it vibro them down, and then they'd weld another section on. So they start out with about a 50-foot piece or a 55-foot piece, drive that down, and then they'll put another piece on top. They'll weld that, drive that down, and then we'll get a hammer and drive it all the way to limestone. So all those are driven down to limestone. They're sitting on limestone. Then we'll fill them with concrete, and then we'll form them up, and we'll pour concrete for the cap. So the approach part that you see here is concrete girders because it's more efficient. So th there's six concrete girders along there all the way down. Easier to build, they're cheaper, they're just more efficient. When you get to the river span, you want a wider gap to get boat and traffic through and everything else. So we're going to use steel. So go ahead. That was my favorite. Uh, Julie's favorite Memorial Day. So we're out. Uh, 
So here we get to the river span. So these are drilled shafts. So about the same distance. So these are a whole different story. So you drill down about the same depth. You get to limestone. Then you put these cages. Go show the cage. So that's a rebar cage that goes inside of these. It's about 11 foot wide. Concrete. You put that down in there. And these are CSL tubes. So all around there, we got these tubes, these pipes that go down. After we pour the concrete, we have monitors that go down and make sure there's no voids. So they're very structurally sound. That's the way we test these. So we'll put these in the drilled shafts, we'll pour them full of concrete. Oh, back to the pipe piles, okay. It's all good. So I don't know how good this video is gonna be, but this is uh, how we're driving the pile after we get down a ways. It's a big hammer. It just knocks it down. You don't have the sound, but crane holds it up. So after you get so far, you use these hammers and we drive them down all the way to limestone. The mass of the hammer, oh, I'm not sure. The mass of it, oh, it's heavy. It's heavy. It's driving these down. <laughs> They're hollow pipe, four foot in diameter, hollow pipe. Well, we'll go in, we'll drill, we'll uh, drive the first section down and we'll drill, we'll uh, drill out the dirt so far and then we'll weld them on and then we'll fill it all with concrete. Oh yeah. It's no fun. It's no fun. But that hammer gets through it. That's a big hammer. You don't find a whole lot of hammers that big. That hammer will get through a lot of stuff. Inch, one inch. Yeah, they're heavy. They're uh, about 30,000 pounds for a 50-foot stick of that pipe. You got you to gotta put your ear protection in when you're next to that. So then, yeah, we get the, we, we form it up, bring in a pump truck, concrete, fill it all full of concrete, and then we're ready to put concrete girders on it. These are the concrete girders. So each pier cap from end to end, we put these concrete girders down here, and then we deck it with these metal decks. We weld the angles to the side. There's the embeds. When they pour these concrete beams, there's embeds poured into them. So then we'll put angles on there, weld it on, and this is our deck. On the sides, we'll also form up wood to keep the sides of the deck. It's about eight and a half inch thick of concrete when we pour this deck. What do you mean? They had to be delivered in order and in the right direction. Oh, yeah, yeah, they all have to. <laughs> well, actually, that one right there was supposed to be down there, but we made it work. That one's, <laughs> they're all, yeah, they're all in order. They're all organized. We got it. Then you get to the river span that I was talking about. These are the steel beams where you can span further. And we deck them the same. There's a little bit different for the decking. There's a whole little bit of a different system, but it's the same, the same panels that we use. Uh, thick of steel on these. Uh, three quarter, they're all different. When you get to the center span, they're they're pretty thick. These are probably about three quarter, but I think they get to in the center, they're like an inch and a quarter thick on the flanges. Oh, Ooh. Is, that, is, that <laughs> is it right here? <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> All right, so just another picture of the steel girders. It just depends on the design. It depends on the design and what you want to do. I mean, this was, uh, this span here in this, with the Missouri River was long enough, but short enough to where you could get by with just that. And uh, yeah, a lot of people think that, but it's cool to watch them blow up, right? <laughs> I get it. I get it. I get it. 
And you know what? The last the last job we came from, like the one she showed you with the uh, the arch, that that was an amazing job. But I've heard like 50-50. Some people miss the truss, and some people are really glad that there's no obstructions. I mean, it's it, it really is 50-50 around the area, which which way you want to go with it. But I mean, it, maintenance, cost. maintenance cost is huge. That's a huge part of it. Which one is what? Oh, the trucks for sure. Yeah, you got to go in there and you got to inspect it every so often. You got to paint it. It's got to be painted. The paint, just the paint alone is ridiculous. How do you QC the steel that you use? And what point in the construction are you checking the, the quality? Of the actual steel and it's and checked at the factory. We have to have certifications that come. Everything's, I mean, we get 20 page sheets of every beam that are certified with the heat numbers and the it, it's we have all the certification from the plant. And then when we when it gets to the job, we inspect it and so where is where is the steel made? This steel? Uh, I'm not sure where the steel came from. Excellent. That's US, steel yes, was, yes, yes. That's steel everything was, on this job is U.S. Everything on this job is U.S. made. That steel was fabricated in Bowling Green, Kentucky. It's no, well, there you go. There you go. I know a little bit about Bowling Green, Kentucky. Everything on this job is from the U.S. It has to be, even from the smallest bolt. I can't even. I can't even get some of these little anchors that I want to use for things that don't really matter and got to be U.S. So and I and I love that. I'm not saying it's got to be, but it's it's all U.S. So after we get the the concrete girders down, the steel girders down, we get the sides formed up. It's time to get some rebar down. And this is I, I thought you'd want to see what the what's inside the concrete that you're driving over. This is how much rebar, two mats of rebar coated in epoxy on these decks. And then here you go again, the crew that it takes, you got a paver up there paving it. You got these guys finishing. There's a guy with a, a vibrator. There's a guy with a vibrator. There's actually two. We have two guys with vibrators that go along, uh, and they're, they're probably inch and a half, inch and a half thick vibrator. They go through, and whenever that's poured, you'll go from this side and pour about a four-foot swath back this way, and there's two guys that go along. It doesn't work. But uh, I think there's one over there on the left. He's got a vibrator right there. I see him. But they'll go through and they'll hit that with a vibrator and make sure it's all consolidated. Mm -mm. Uh, here's a good video. This is, uh, this is, yeah, it should be. So how do you get, how do you pour concrete 300 feet away? Can't drive a truck, concrete truck out there, can you? Can you play that again? Some of the, uh, so we had a pump truck on land that would pump to this barge, and then we'd have slick lines, pipe that pumped the concrete over to that side to another pump truck that would pump down there where we're pouring. So there was, there was some ingenuity in pouring all this. It wasn't just, hey, Pour some concrete so we can drive already, you know? <laughs> and then how, how do you get the pump truck out there in the water? Seventy eight thousand pounds. Yeah, the guy driving was just like, whoa. <laughs> We had them covered, though. <laughs> Finger joints. So 
the worst the worst part of the bridge is the finger joints if you're driving across you're like oh love this new bridge that's these so you have to have expansion and contraction joints that's these this is the base of them i think the next picture shows the like final pro well that there's just so you know there's a lot that goes into these that's so these fingers here can go back and forth from the heat and you'd be amazed how much these things shrink and swell. It's really amazing. The guys will be start working on them in the morning and then 20 degrees later in the afternoon, start all over because it's, it's not there. You have to anchor these things in place. And then around here, we have to pour UHPC, which is ultra high performance concrete. It's, I don't, I can't even, I'm not going to get into it because I'll throw some, but it's not easy. So bear with us. We're, we're, <laughs> We're going to perfect the eastbound and we're going to get these finger joints dead on and we're going to work on these other ones also. Barrier rail so we don't drive off. This is what this has got a machine that runs through there, feeds it full of concrete, and that's your barrier rail on each side. Ah, blooper section. So this is how stuff shows up. Not all the time, but we thought we'd throw some fun stuff in here. This is the, yeah, the kind of truckloads we get. Oops, no. Pans, the pans that go on the deck. So, this, I mean, we order it up. Oh, yeah, it'll be down there Tuesday. Well, next Thursday, this shows up. So it's, <laughs> yeah. The decking, like in between the, the girders that I showed you, the concrete girders. Yeah, that's that. this is what we use for in between the girders. Yeah, yeah, but now we got all new. It's all it's all good. But like I'm trying to say, it's not always fun. It's it's not always easy. Stop. Thought we'd leave you with a bang. I know you guys don't want to talk about the demo, but you all seen all the demo videos. You know? Yeah, still had the pure caps to blow, and well, I was on the interstate stopping traffic, so I don't. You don't want to see mine. It's, it's yeah, it wasn't that fun. It shows a speedometer and a couple of officers behind me, and yeah, it wasn't very fun. Oh yeah, there's some good videos out there. A lot of people. There's a lot of video out there actually. It was some. It was cool. I didn't get. A, I didn't get to see any of these, but that's beside the point. Bridge fall. Yeah. And it fell absolutely square. It was nice. It didn't tilt. It didn't yeah. wobble. It just came straight down. It was good. It was really, really a good it, blast. You you had to really do some really good explosive timing it was uh we have a really good engineer and he designed so what we did was we cut because you know it's going to drop in the river and we're not going to want to send a bunch of divers down there to cut and all that stuff so we pre-cut about three quarters of the way through just enough to where it could still stand and then they came in and like in between every cord to where it would be enough for the crane to handle they blew that by that's why the bottom looks like it had a lot more explosions because that was the most important to get all that bottom cut where we needed it and then they cut it in just a few spots on the top so when it fell it was still sticking out of the river and we could cut in certain spots and yank it out of there without having to go underneath hey I we're down river from it and so i was able to see it fall mm -hmm. and it fell absolutely level without any tilting wobbling and that said to me that you had to have really almost perfect timing yeah. of all of the explosions that went on. Yeah, they did really well. Yeah, I they thought did. so. It looked it looked fantastic. Did really well on that one. Yes, it was it was months of planning. It was a lot of planning for that one. It was and they did well. So Yeah. And the, the clean out went really well. They, they did pretty well with the clean out too.
No, it was nothing to watch except for anybody have any questions? Well, thanks for the presentation. It was really fascinating stuff. Uh, when you blew up the old um, piers, I know you had to remove all that material that got blown up, but you probably couldn't remove it all, right? Was there a specification for how much was left in the river? Uh, no, we we the Corps of Engineers came back. We have another scan also. So we had sonar come, and uh, Corps of Engineers did their deal. We have another one coming to sign off with MoDOT. I mean, I... I'd be surprised. You'd be surprised. We did. We got it, pretty much everything out of there. The rebar part in the old piers. I mean, there might be a piece or two, but we did really well. They they really did their due diligence to get everything out of there. The way the engineer designed it to where the, the truss part, especially the way the engineer designed it, there was no way to leave anything in there because there was only certain places that were blown and then the top pieces but yeah that makes makes sense for the truss i'm wondering about all the pieces of the pier what was did you use a clamshell to pull pull that material out or how did you go about getting it we have a clamshell out there we also have several excavators digging and then they had a magnet going down and yep yeah they they did very well with that no only one only one per person into our local radio station the talk radio kflu mm -hmm. and they had a somebody called in yeah. and said oh you know I, I i don't like the new bridge uh, i preferred the one with the truss right and that was one thing and then she said well i've got this big dually pickup and i'm when i'm driving over the bridge i feel like i'm just gonna go right over the side into the river and the, the thought that occurred to me was yeah okay the engineers that designed this bridge did it right so that that isn't gonna happen right honestly that's a good question that's a good point the barrier rail that they had on each side for the previous one was six inches shorter than the one we have now we have 42 inches now and there's no way and it's thicker so well i mean <laughs> so <laughs> can i get build it out of glass i would be i wouldn't be up here talking <laughs> So can I get a second question then? So on that same radio show, somebody else called in and said, what's going to happen to all the, all the scrap steel work? And uh, yeah. it's got value, right? Oh, yeah. There's value in it. Oh, yeah. Sin significant value. Oh, yeah. There was how many pounds of it? Uh, I think in total about 9 million. Yeah, 9 million pounds, right? Yeah. yeah. So and that wasn't going to go in the landfill. It went It went to no, be it recycled. Got right. It got recycled, reused, every bit of it. Every bit of it was recycled and reused, yes. Yep. We're recycling and reusing all the concrete also. The Port Authority, we worked really hard to make connections with them, and they're they're using that to build a new port out there. I mean, even all the slabs, everything got recycled in this job. It, I'm really actually proud to be part of this because everything that we could recycle, we did. It was, I mean, there's really not much, nothing with the landfill. I mean, I it's really cool how much we recycled on this job. It really is. <laughs> Do it again. Hello. Driving on it now, when people say it feels like I'm going to drive right over the edge, you're also driving on the shoulder. When we open both sides of the bridge, there is a shoulder on either side. That's a good point. So right now you're driving on the shoulder. That's a good so point. You're people gonna... say it doesn't ride perfectly smooth. Well, one, we're going to resurface it. And two, you're driving on the shoulder. <laughs> that is a good point. You are going to have a 12 foot shoulder on the in three lanes. So you won't feel congested. We're there's a three lane interstate that's being used as four way, two way, two lanes each way right now. So. Uh, does your company have its own diving team or do you, is that something that's usually contracted out? It's contracted out. Yeah, we have a subcontractor. I might clarify uh, Martin's question here about the barrier walls. Our previous standard bar I, I work for MoDOT, just so, so you know. Um, our previous standard barrier wall was two foot eight, which is 32 inches. 
our new standard barrier wall is 42 inches single slope, like you see there. Mm -hmm. um, I've, I've heard the same people. Uh, I look at Facebook, I see the same things. The truss is a protective thing. Uh, you know, when the incident happened with the tractor trailers and the, and the cars and so on. Um, if you get a truck or something into that truss, the whole bridge might go down. Um, so that the truss is not a protective thing. It's the structure holding the bridge up. This, the structure holding the bridge up is these steel plate girders and the concrete girders that Mike and Julie talked about. It's all underneath. It's not going to get hit by any vehicles. So if something does go over the barrier wall and it is 10 inches higher than the other uh, previous, um, the only thing that's going to be lost is the person that goes over the barrier wall. The bridge is not going to suffer any issues. So um, back to the previous question as well about uh, this is not aesthetically pleasing or whatever. It's just a plate girder thing. Um, we're from Missouri and we're poor as far as addressing our infrastructure. Um, and this, as Mike said, is the efficient way to cross the river. If you wanna build something fancy with, uh, you know, uh, for the span range here of less than 500 feet, a plate girder is the perfect thing. When you get higher than 500 feet, um, you know, the tied arches type thing, the uh, basket arch that you built in uh, at I-74 for Iowa, cable stays, those types of structures are when you get to span lengths that are much greater than 500 feet. This is the most economical, cheap solution. They wanted in a design build pursuit. They were the best value proposed. Um, the three lanes in each direction uh, is gonna fit in perfectly with the governor's $2.8 billion that we got to rebuild I-70. So, um, it's a great structure. It's safe. Um, I saw that little explosion there with the pier and they dropped a little concrete on the roadway. They just went over that. <laughs> <laughs> but anyhow, it's all safe. So it's great. No, I saw I, it. I saw it. <laughs> no, I agree. And I, 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 I appreciate that. Yes, it is. And the thing is, I said earlier, 50% of the people like it one way and 50% the other way. But I think the 50% probably are used to seeing that truss bridge. But think about it. When you come across eastbound, across that bridge, and see those bluffs, you had you had a big truss in your way. Now it's wide open. And I, me personally, and I, and I love this area. And thank you so much for everybody's been so welcoming and so nice down here. I really do appreciate that. But now when I drive eastbound over that bridge, I think it's awesome that you can just see that whole bluff. And it's there's nothing in the way now. I I. I kind of have a whole different outlook on that I, th I think it's beautiful i mean i you took away a distraction and like i said i think people you know got used to that and they they're sad to see it go but now you get to see every, that bluff is beautiful why would you not want that you know distraction there but it's i i think you'll like i think everybody will like it you'll love the three lanes the shoulder <laughs> So I have a question about education and the trades for maybe for Julie and stuff is, um, is every field, I mean, are you really lacking in finding workplace or people to come on the work site? And, um, you know, for those of us that have high school, college students and, uh, you know, where are we, where are we, uh, like we have any control of this, but, um, <laughs> What, what kind Actually, of experiences and education and I mean, are you even do like have control people? over it? Yeah. So, so yes, we have had a, I won't say an impossible job, but a somewhat impossible job trying to man this, this job. That's why so many of my employees have had to come from Black River Falls. Um, there are less and less people entering the trades every day. And I believe, and again, this is my opinion, right? I believe there are less and less people entering the trades because, and I'm a mom, I have a 20 year old and a 13 year old and my children are going to college. So we kind of drill it into our children that the only options that they have is to go to college. That's actually not true. So some of the gentlemen that are working on my job site that did not go to college make far more money than I do and I have a master's degree. So 
I think the best thing that we can do is one, college isn't for everyone. Two, you can start in the trades and still go to college. You just don't do it as quickly. You can also earn as much or more money as someone who went to college and have equal as equally as many opportunities um, and not have, you know, 30, 40, $50,000 in debt once you leave. Um, there's also a lot of training programs available. So you can have your on the job training where you get your journeyman's card and then you go on to get more education after that. So we need to let parents first know that their children's only opportunity does not have to be a four-year degree. Um, but just because they choose not to do that, that that's not the end all for them either. And that goes in the construction trades, the welding trades, the manufacturing. We, we don't have welders. We don't have machinists. We don't have carpenters. We don't have laborers. We don't have operators. Um, and we can't build America if we don't have anybody showing up. So that's my soapbox. I'll get off of it. <laughs> this is really a simplistic question, I guess. But when you drove those uh, those steel tubes in for the supports for the, did it have a sealed cap at the bottom? No. So did you pump that out then yep. once? Okay. Yep. It was drilled. And then if there was any water, we pumped that out. Yep pumped out and before yep. you put the concrete yep. in there. Our old bridge kind of had a tendency to ice up. There was like a major accident on it every year or two. With your new bridge, will it have less, less of a tendency because of some design characteristics? Or are there any designs in the works that would be, have less of that tendency to ice up? Uh, right there, the grades pretty. Uh, it's tough, but yeah, I don't think you'll have any issues. You shouldn't have any issues there. That all the engineers worked it out, and we, we built it according to design. And I don't. I mean, you'll still have your frost. the The thing right there is with all that fog, all the fog coming up and then freezing. That's that's a like major accidents there every year or two where people are yeah. dying. And it's but nice as far as shedding, the, yeah, we uh, we even added some drains to make sure that we had enough over there. But I, I think, and I think more probably is the 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 frost and all that coming up from that. It gets fog, really, really foggy there. I've never seen anything like it. It's cool, but it's not good. Yeah. <laughs> so I've I've got another question. Um, you you had a couple. I'm over here. You had a couple of allusions. Hey. <laughs> had a couple of allusions to the crumpling infrastructure in this country, and you see a lot of bridges in the built in the 20s and the 30s that are definitely crumbling. What's the design life for this one? 100 years. Is that based on structure? Is that based on capacity? Uh, both. Both. Both, yep. They put all that in there. Uh, can we go back to the college issue question? I'm over here now. Um, so I know traditionally people were pushed by their parents to go to college because working in the trade was very hard on the body and you would get wrecked by the time retirement came along. So like in the past, I don't know, 50 years, what sort of um, techniques or uh, things have been put in place to like reduce that stress on the body? Well, I think that safety programs have come a a long way like well the first of all there is safety let's start there <laughs> so that used to be a non-issue um so safety is a much bigger thing um equipment is a much there we have much more advanced equipment now um we have much better ways of doing things i mean i don't know how to describe it other than than um like it's not the same repetitive things because you have equipment that can do a lot of that we have a lot more safety equipment we are knowledgeable about safety equipment. I also, I mean, you hate to say it, but the world has become more medically oriented, right? So everybody has better access to healthcare. So my dad's a retired carpenter. That's how I, it's probably how I got here. And when he would come home from work when I was 10, um, he was completely filthy. He didn't wear safety goggles. He rarely wore a helmet. I mean, the world has changed, right? And, and that goes everywhere across the board. So um, we have a safety meeting every morning. 
every single morning out there. The guys stretch every morning before they start their job and they are given a task and a way to go about it. And it's, it's discussed in the best way of doing it. We have ongoing classes on how to lift something, how to carry something, what equipment to wear. I, we've just come a long way in the world. So I'm not going to say that it is amazingly wonderful to be out there when it's 20 to below zero and the wind is blowing, but we got to build bridges. And that is, that is the truth. I got to tell you, my back hurts and I sit at a desk every day. <laughs> I understand. That's good to hear though. That's really good to hear. I just wanted to add to what you were saying. One of the things that I've noticed is that the workers work in crews. And there's usually one or two, what I've seen on the MoDOT crews on the road, there's usually one or two people doing something and two other people watching, and then they'll switch. So they're rotating. And so that gives everybody a chance to rest. And it's Fatigue not is so definitely much taken into yeah. consideration. I mean, you hate to say that everything's gover governmently ran, but OSHA definitely has limitations on no one can work alone. You have to have signalers. You have to have people supervising everything. Um, you have to have classes to know how to properly handle the equipment and and I mean your body is equipment, right? The so other yeah, I, the world's yeah. come a long way. The other issue along the same lines is when I was in high school, I had four years of industrial arts, woodworking, metalworking, electronics, and those were the most valuable courses that I remember, right? So I'm a scientist. I use what I learned in those courses all the time in my research. But one of the disappointing things to me was the high school I went to eliminated industrial arts, right? So now there's no reason for people, they don't experience how to build things, how to do things. It's all so intellectual, you know, I got to go to college. That's the only route. That's vocational schools there are tremendously good vocational schools in the country. They're not highlighted. That's why I have spent so much time working on the STEM program and why it is so near and dear to my heart. And that's why I reach out to you guys. And like I said, I want you to do it with your children. I want you to do it with your grandchildren. And I want you to take it to their grade schools. Because if we can't reach these children when they're six and seven, by the time they're 18, they are not interested and they have no idea of what we do. So when I was growing up, I grew up with hammers and nails. My dad's a carpenter. Most children out there don't have dads that are carpenters and they don't even know how to hammer a nail. So we are doing our, our youth a disservice by not teaching them how to change their oil, how to change their tires and how to hammer a nail. So if you guys go out there and then you get on MoDOT's website and you download my STEM lessons and they go somewhere other than just when I was here on this project, you've done the world some good. I, we have to get children interested in fixing some stuff themselves, or I cannot tell you how many of the guys that are on my project right now that called on the phone and said, Hey, I work for the local carpenters union and I really want to be a part of this project because they live here and they want to be able to tell their grandchildren that they built the I-70 Rocheport bridge. Do you know how excited I am to tell my children that I built the I-74 double basket handle bridge that'll be there long after I'm dead? Like, this is just how you have to inspire them to be interested in it. Otherwise, they are going to want to be computer engineers. And we have enough of those. And I've been involved in a few of those STEM projects where we go to schools. I think a third grade, a fifth grade. These kids light up. They've never seen anything like it. They, they, it's, it's amazing. It, it's so rewarding. It's amazing to me to go in there. And watch these kids just light up. They're so happy. They've never even been involved in anything like this. And to Kenya, that, that's why I, I really appreciate her so much. She works so hard for it. And she does have a very valid point. We need to keep getting this out there to these children. If you could see what I see, they just light up. And it's maybe it's something that they never even ever thought about. But now it's in their head. Oh, I want to build a bridge when I get older. That if, if it's one kid in one STEM program, that's a huge, huge start. It really is. The, the trades are dwindling. They really are. I see it every day. It's hard. It's hard to get people out there to help build this infrastructure. And if we don't have people out there to build America, I, I, where do we go from there? So I've got a few more questions. And one came in um, 
from folks watching online. Um, and I, I think this is probably for you, Julie, wondering um, what are some of the things that the disadvantaged businesses that you hired, like some of the tasks, some of the parts of this whole process that uh, those businesses were involved in? So the Road to Rocheport videos are done by Excel Business Concepts. And um, that's a, a DBE and she does social media. Um, we have PJR is a, I'm going to say steel erection company and they are female owned. Um, yeah, so Jordan slip forming. Um, we also ordered some of the steel that you knew where it came from, came from Portland and that's a, a DBE. And then um, KN, is it KNN? Yeah, no, no oh, DNK. DNK, okay. They all have initials for their names. So DNK is a welding company also. Rebar. Rebar, okay. Yeah, so I met them at the, um, we also use a lot of DBEs for trucking and we're looking into a new DBE for um, the milling when we take something down. I don't know, I was just talking to uh, Talat for that. So. The nice thing about the DBE program is also our cleaning crew is DBE, um, our portageons are DBE, our landscaping is DBE. I know there's some that I haven't mentioned because I'm not sitting there filling out the report. Oh, but, yeah. um, you'd be surprised. The great thing about the DBE program though is if there's some portions of them of the job that they cannot do, that's our job to help support them. Like they are small businesses. The whole point of the DBE program is that they are disadvantaged and that they are, they're smaller. And it's our job to mentor them into becoming larger companies. So eventually they're not in the DBE program anymore. Like our landscaping company that just graduated. Awesome. Um, another question came in from someone who walked into our office actually um, couldn't make it cause he had to give his neighbor's cats like insulin shots tonight. So, um, he was wondering, um, okay. So, you know, we've got in order to like switch back and forth from the bridges as this whole project is going on, we've got these like switch over lanes built in. His question was basically, um, like, is, is there sort of a plan in the ultimate plan of operations for this bridge which is it's obviously not you it's kind of a modoc question like if there's an accident when the bridges are finalized and there's an accident that closes one of the bridges like is it possible to reroute traffic to the existing bridge that isn't blocked and change like the lane configuration this is maybe your question i don't know the do you get where i'm i don't know how to ask this question Yeah. And uh, much of that will be in the existing right of way. So what you see over here is uh, a 42 inch median barrier and we'll have to have access points for emergency vehicles, uh, police, uh, highway patrol to make turnarounds and things like that. Um, the The reason for the two bridges that are symmetrical, they both have three lanes in the final configuration, as Julie said, with wide shoulders. Uh, so when we need to redeck the one bridge 50 years from now or 60 years from now, we can put all the traffic on there. So it's in the plan. I don't know the specifics of how that's going to operate or if we can turn it around in, you know, an hour because we have an accident on the eastbound bridge and we want to get everything on the westbound. I've, I'm not involved in that level of detail on this project, but, but yes. Cool. Thank you. And I, I have several more questions. Are there any other ones or can I just roll with these? Okay. One of them is, um, so the, the big wetland, the scour lake that's underneath, um, the Western side of the bridge you had to build a road across it to, to get to the construction site next to the river. Does that um, get removed, that, that yes, road? Yes, that'll all be removed. Uh -huh. Cool. 
um that that lake is like one of the cool treasures left by the 93 flood and i know it's a huge pain in your butts but like yes those of us that live here are like kind of huge it. yeah it's really <laughs> but yes yeah, so we'll remove that causeway awesome um and then my last question um i i i might have missed it but i don't think you talked about like the process of like creating and pouring the piers the big piers um on the new bridge you know that are holding it up like i remember at one point going by and there's this i don't know if it's called a caisson or yep. what you know this this big yep. metal structure with rebar sticking out of the top and then the pier was being done in the middle like could you just walk a, a brief sort of version of like how you do that well we drill a we have a big case on, we drill it down all the way to... And what's a case on? It's a big round steel pipe, about an inch thick. It's maybe more, it might be more than an inch for the case ons, but yeah, we drill that down all the way to bedrock, put steel in it and pour it full of concrete. And the steel that we, where we stop pouring the concrete, the steel still comes up above that. And then we add on to it and there'll be a cold joint there where the old concrete, the new concrete match. And then we'll pour the columns up. Uh, there's some struts in a couple of them that'll go across and hold them together. And then uh, we'll go out and build the pier cap and then the steel girders will set on top of that. So it's essentially the same process like you were talking about the ones on land where you're driving that pipe down in. It, pretty much, bed, pretty right? much. We More beat the same. ones on land down and there's some, there's a drilled shaft on land here too. But yeah, they get, they get drilled, drilled down. There's these 11 foot, diameter pipes that they've got these drill rigs and they drill them all the way down to bedrock and then they have to get into bedrock to seat it so we once you get to bedrock you still go a little further and drill that out and then you clean all that out put your rebar in there pour that full and of they concrete have to like pump it out of water yep. the whole time yeah there's a whole process going. there's a whole big process with all that but yeah you get it down there get you a key into the limestone and go from there in, in some of the famous uh, uh, bridge building back in the early part of the uh, 20th century, there was problems with um, uh, people having breathing problems with uh, the bins or having, but this is not deep enough of a structure that you had any issues with uh, gas buildup or, or, uh, or, or the bins for workers in this project. No, there was nobody that, I mean, we had some divers go down to make sure all the, you know, everything was cleaned out of the river bottom, but everything was done from above, from off of barges. And yeah, there was, we didn't really have to deal with that at all. It's the, the river's so low right now. Right. You know, could walk across <laughs> it almost. Especially right now. I know. Like I you know. can barely float your barges. It's making it difficult right? for our barges. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, is there any other questions? Awesome. You do. Just a second. The rivers hasn't really flooded during the construction. Was there planning? In the very in beginning, it did. I, I wasn't down here then, but in the very beginning, it did. But we've just, I mean, it's been low. Low, that's been more of a complication than anything. And some ice jams and some things like that. But other so, than that. So low is almost as much of a problem for us as high. We can't. Um, because we can't get our equipment in and out. So we planned when we bid this bridge to be able to bring our equipment in on a barge that's not possible <laughs> so we've actually had more low we came into this project being told by everyone in missouri that this was the worst river ever and it can raise bazillions of feet in bazillions of seconds and we're like okay so we came in ready for flood and we got drought <laughs> but that's part of construction and it's part of the journey and it's worked out fine and like I said, MoDOT's a great partner. So we've been able to get around every one of the pro problems that we've come to, but believe it or not, low water is as much of a problem as high. Maybe more. Yeah, yeah it is. All right. Well, you guys, uh, Mike, Julie, thank you. Well, thank you for having us. Thank you so much. Thanks for everyone for coming out.